We are so glad you've dropped into Christ Community Church, Lawrence, Kansas, online. We've begun the summer-long process of returning to worship services in our building while still providing the online experience. This summer, we're providing two Sunday morning services. At 9 a.m., we have a face mask required service. Then, our volunteers disinfect the used areas, and the second service begins at 10.30 a.m., where face masks are optional. Here at Christ Community, our mission is to make lifelong, authentic disciples of Jesus Christ. We are committed to helping everyone take their first or their next steps with Jesus. It is our goal as the church to give people a place to belong, believe, and become. We think everyone needs a place to belong. If you're contemplating that first step with Jesus or ready for your next steps, you're welcome. Knowing what to believe is vital too. The Bible is our source for that. The Bible is how we learn about Jesus. And that is how everyone becomes who God designed them to be. In the early days of AOL email, Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks started in a hit movie called You've Got Mail. Maybe some of you remember it? Did you know that We've Got Mail too? It's true. Jesus has written love letters to his bride, the church. Our new sermon series, We've Got Mail, is going to explore seven letters that Jesus sent to seven different churches. These letters are full of timeless lessons about the care and the plans that Jesus has for his church. These letters are honest, but they're always hopeful. Most importantly, they've revealed Jesus' heart. These letters are in the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation. Revelation is a great title for that book because each letter reveals something about Jesus. And in learning about Jesus, we learn about ourselves. We are living in an extraordinary, uneasy time. And for such extraordinary times, Jesus, through these letters, has an extraordinary message. Interested in Sunday Sermon Notes? Let us know by emailing church at cccLawrence.org, and you can expect to get them every Friday. You can also learn more about us on our website, cccLawrence.org. If you would like to support the ministry of Christ Community Church, we've made that easy too. Just go to our website, cccLawrence.org slash donate or text 84321. I think all of us have gotten pieces of mail addressed to occupant. Jesus doesn't do that. He knows our names and he knows just where we are. He always is present, always at work, and he cares about everything and everyone. Again, to remind you, our church community wants to help you take your first step or your next steps with Jesus. Check out our website for more information about Bible studies, life groups, student ministries, or even send us a prayer request. You can contact Pastor Jeff through our website, as well as get connected and have meaningful conversations. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you and may his face shine upon you today. God's best to you, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Hey, good morning, everyone. Pastor Jeff Barkley. Like our introduction said, we've got mail. Here at Christ Made Church, the first Sunday of each month is also Communion Sunday. So if you're at home, you may have already gotten the sermon notes and the announcement that we're doing communion. You might be prepared to do that right now. I'm going to uh, share in communion as an introduction to the sermon because we've got so much extra material about this letter that we're going to look at today, Jesus' letter to the church in Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7. That's our main text today, but there's lots of other information about Ephesus, information that we don't have uh, about the other six churches. We have 
Revel uh, uh, Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 20, and then an entire letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians called the book of Ephesians. So I'm going to be pulling a little bit from there as we prepare for communion uh, in our in-service uh, worship times here on Sunday morning. We'll be using these individually uh, factory sealed cups. We want to make sure everyone stays safe. And so we're glad that, that these are available to us. And we've got lots to last us into the fall if necessary. We uh, really want to be concerned about people's safety. So as we share in communion, I want to go back to some things that we said last week at the end of the message. Remember, the sermon last week was about the seven candlesticks and about Jesus walking in the midst of them. We mentioned that the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus, does not mean doomsday. It means the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus in the midst of his seven golden candlesticks. We said that those seven candlesticks represent the church of Jesus Christ, seven specific churches in history, but we also believe that uh, these messages are for the church today. So uh, we're one of those candles up there, and imagine Jesus walking in the midst. And in that context, listen to the, the capstone verse from our text today. As we think about Christ in Ephesus, our relationship with him, as we prepare to take his broken body, the symbols of his broken body and his shed blood. It says this in, second, uh, in, in the second chapter of Revelation 4 through 5. This is what Jesus said. He's pointing out that things aren't quite what they were in his relationship with them. And he had not gone anywhere, so his view is that they had uh, left their first love. Listen to this. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary in your well-doing, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had for me at first. You've abandoned me, your first love. That's relevant from how we finished last week. Remember we said this, I was quoting from a, a podcast that I very, very much enjoy. It opens like this. Together, let's slow down and pay a closer attention to the most significant person in all of history, Jesus Christ. It's where I adopted the phrase, let's pay a ridiculous amount of attention to Jesus. And I said, in the days ahead, beginning now, last week, let's make much of Jesus. The early church, especially as it manifested itself in uh, the city of Ephesus, made much of Jesus. For two years, the Apostle Paul had taught uh, in first the synagogue and then in a hall or the school of Tyrannus, uh, dis discussing, arguing for the kingdom of God, preaching repentance and faith toward Jesus. This was a city given to, uh, uh, you know, abject paganism, the, the cultic, sensual worship of Artemis. Uh, uh, the, the, the city of Artemis was full, full of uh, occultism. The Temple of Artemis was just north of the large amphitheater that was in Ephesus. At one time, the world's largest bank was in Ephesus. Paul is preaching. Much is being made of Jesus, and Jesus begins to move. There's extraordinary miracles that occur in Ephesus. There's healings and deliverances. And listen to what it says then about that in Acts 19 verse 17. Again, we're giving background material to this church in Ephesus leading into our communion time, and then we're going to walk right into the sermon. And this became known to the residents of Ephesus. What was being known to them? As they made much of Jesus, Jesus began to move in deliverances, in conversions, and healings. And this became known to the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of Jesus was greatly honored. So in the early days of the church in Ephesus, they remembered their first love. The name of Jesus was greatly honored, and God began to move because of the famousness of Jesus in that city. They paid a ridiculous amount of attention to Jesus, they focused on the most central person in all of history, Jesus. Fast forward then. Eventually, Paul is there for, uh, he's involved with Ephesus for almost three years. 
He now has made a whirlwind tour. He's gone up north into Macedonia, present-day Balkan states, uh, Serbia, uh, Kosovo, that area, Bulgaria, that modern-day area now. Then he came back through Greece. Then he sailed to a coastal city in the Aegean Sea called Troas. Now on his way to Jerusalem, he wants to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost. He lands in Miletus, which is south of the Ephesus, which was also a port city, and he calls for the elders to visit with him. God has revealed to Paul that he will not be coming back, that his journey to Jerusalem will ultimately end in his death. He wants to say goodbye, but more importantly, he wants to give the leaders of the church of Ephesus some final admonitions. And as we read uh, this letter that Jesus will later write 30 years after this, it's obvious that in nearly every way, the church in Ephesus had never forgotten Jesus' words. So as we prepare to share in this meal, this body of Jesus, the broken body of Jesus, this bread and this cup, which represents the shed blood of Jesus, I want to read this. These are Paul's final words to the church in Ephesus, who in just a moment will read the letter that Jesus sent 30 years later to them. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with Jesus' own blood. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my body broken for you. His broken body is for my wholeness, my mental wholeness, my physical wholeness, my spiritual wholeness. He said, take and eat and do some remembrance of me. And then Paul said, remember to feed the flock, which he has purchased with his own blood. This cup represents that blood. Jesus said that last night, the night he was betrayed, he said, this is my blood shed for you, the blood of the new covenant, a new agreement. I will not drink it again with you until I come into my kingdom, which is coming, which is coming. But he purchased his church with his own blood. That's what this cup represents. Drink, as Jesus said, and drink all of it. See, there's a good chance that what we just did, Paul did with those folks in Miletus as he met with the church in Ephesus. Quite often, teaching opportunities, worship opportunities, uh, finished with a common meal, a fellowship meal, a koinonia a feast. At the end of that feast, they would share then in the Lord's Supper. I want to read what else Paul said to these elders in Ephesus that apparently most of what he said they remembered. His church purchased with his own blood over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers or leaders. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day, and my many tears for you. We hear the heart of Jesus in that, don't we? As Jerusalem once wept over the city of Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and Paul acknowledges that he shared tears like that over his converts in Ephesus. And now I entrust you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, he says, and give you an inheritance among all those that he has set apart unto himself. These words rang through the church in Ephesus and carried them into this time that we're going to read a little bit after 90 AD as Paul, uh, as John now has been uh, exiled to the island of Patmos, this dry, desolate, fruitless place, yet Jesus reveals himself to John to reveal himself to these seven churches, to reveal himself in a richer, fuller way to us in our day. Here's what we've said, and we're moving now into the sermon. Here's what we've said. We've got four uh, uh, key points or four action points uh, to this message. Number one, if Jesus says something to you in these letters and they're a commendation to you, rejoice in it, wear it, put it on and celebrate it. 
If he commends you, rejoice in it. It's okay to do that. If you read something in here and you go, oh my, he's talking to me. If he speaks a word of correction to you or to our church, then we need to put that on too. If the shoe fits, that's the goal here, we're going to wear it. We're going to confess it, we're going to humble ourselves, and we're going to respond appropriately and correctly to his corrections. Thirdly, we need to understand that in light of Jesus' revelation to his churches, in light of that, we need to ask ourselves specifically, Jesus, what are you saying to me? What are you revealing to me? I believe there's a word for you. I don't believe this word will ever contradict this word, but there's specific things in our circles of influence and in our spheres of living right now where we really, really need, I don't know about you, but I really, really need specific words on how I'm supposed to behave. I want my life to shine from the candlestick. Remember, my spirit is the candle of the Lord. We said that last week, Proverbs 20, 27. And when I put my lit spirit in a lampstand, I want it to be seen. I want to be active and dynamic and vital in my relationship with Jesus in this world. I do not want my candle under a bushel. I want it to be seen, as it says in Matthew chapter 5, that people might see our good works and give glory to our Father that is in heaven. And then fourthly, another action point is, each one of these letters ends with a commendation and a promise to the conqueror, to the overcomer. It's our right to celebrate faithfulness. He who endures to the end, he who overcomes, he who conquers, he who is strong to the finish. If you've ever done a, a race or been involved in some kind of activity, everyone gets a medal. Not Everyone actually thinks that's a good idea, but I do. If you've worked hard, you've trained, and you've finished your race, you deserve the accolades. You may not be first to the finish line, but you finish. Congratulations. And that's Jesus' heart towards us. My son, my daughter, my brother, my sister, you finished. Well done. And we'll see in this letter, the promise would be to eat from the tree of life which was once in the paradise of God with the, the, our, our parents, Adam and Eve, and now in the presence of God, and we'll eat it again someday if we're strong to the finish, if we overcome, if we conquer all that comes against us in the name of Jesus. So Ephesians 2, here's the text, seven verses, this letter to the church at Ephesus, penned by John, but spoken to John from Jesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus. Remember, the angel we decided were messengers, human messengers, delivering this message. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. These are these, these messengers again. And so the message that Jesus brings to the church is in his right hand. He's protecting and providing care. So important is the message that he wants the church to have that he's holding the messengers in his right hand. And he who walks among the seven golden candlesticks represented by these behind me. Jesus walks in the midst of his church. Jesus is present in the midst of his church. Where two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst of them. We're gathered together right now in the name of Jesus. We're not in the same room, but we're in the same spiritual space. And please understand, Jesus is with you right now in the midst of your candlestick. I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Remember, Paul said this was going to happen. It happened. And go on to say that they have finished strong and they're hanging in there with it. They're withholding and pushing back the wolves to protect the sheep. But you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. Remember, Paul said, grievous Men will come out from your own uh, number, grievous wolves, not sparing the flock. And that was happening. And, and the church was able to discern who those people were. And they were able to say no and resist them and, and put them out to protect the integrity, the doctrinal integrity of the church. You tested them and you found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently, verse 3, and bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. It must have been difficult. It must have been toilsome. It must have been trying. But it says they had not grown weary. Then we've already read this verse. It's sobering. It's honest. 
Jesus is going to point out that something seems different between you and I speaking to the church. But I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love that you had for me at first. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen. It's actually a description of falling out of love. We use that phrase, don't we? Well, they fell out of love. That's really the, the verbiage here. And it's an amazing thing how they could be serving Jesus doctrinally, but not serving him passionately. The title of this message is uh, uh, <laughs> Passionate About Doctrine, Passionless About Jesus. It's a question, isn't it? Are we passionate about doctrine and passionless about Jesus? But I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Something's changed, he's saying. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. That's a strong word. Repent means to change your, your direction, to change your ways, and to change your mind. And do the works that you did at first. Do you remember when we were dating? That's what Jesus is saying to the church. Remember the, those days of courtship? Do you remember when you, you couldn't stop thinking of me because Jesus would say to us, I can't stop thinking of you? If you do not, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. That is almost impossible for me to imagine. But how serious Jesus takes the love relationship we have with him because he knows that no doctrine is helpful or meaningful at all unless there's not love behind it. It's also in the book of uh, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, where it says that truth must be spoken in love. Uh, truth spoken without love defaults into legalism. And, and we, we want to avoid that. It defaults into judgmentalism. And, and we're not to do that. Only Jesus can do that. And so he says, if you don't change, I'm going to come and remove your candle. Take away you from the lampstand. Yet I do have this in your favor as well. I also hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If I could, let me just unpack some of these words just a little bit more. Ephesus was a church built in hardworking, solid in doctrine, enduring opposition, discerning, yet loveless in practice. A church so loveless, in fact, that unless they changed their ways, he was going to remove their lampstand. An action to be interpreted in some of the Bible translations, the, some of the newer ones, New Living Translation, the Passion Translation, says, I'm going to remove you from your impact. I'm going to remove you from your influence. And certainly, we don't want a church without Jesus influencing anything. To be totally honest, if Jesus isn't influencing me, I don't want me influencing me. I want someone to come who's been influenced by Jesus to influence me, to impact me. And here's the deal. It should not take a spiritual rocket scientist for us to understand that in this moment in American history, frankly, in this moment in world history, that there is a shaking going on, an awakening going on. It's an awakening moment. We preached an entire sermon series on that. This is a moment for the church to wake up to our first love, to rediscover our first love, that our first love with Jesus is so premier and so important right now. We need to make much of Jesus. We need to begin paying a ridiculous amount of attention to Jesus as he walks in our candlesticks to slow down a little bit and pay attention to the most significant person in all of history. And remember, in our most recent sermon series, Reentry, we talked about how the reentry, we were referencing coming back into our buildings to go back out in ministry. We said that in coming from space, the space capsule, the, 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 the safest of reentries are still shaky, violent, uh, full of friction events, heat. Lots of heat. Are you experiencing the heat right now of reentry as the churches were coming back into our buildings to go back out into ministry? Do you sense the friction? There's a lot of it. 
And it's important for us now to rediscover in a powerful way our first love, our Savior, the one who purchased us by his own blood, the Son of Man. Remember we read in Revelation 1, the Son of Man who walks in the midst of the candlestick. Jesus described himself as the Son of Man, 19, Luke 19, 10, at the table of Zacchaeus. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so, as we make Jesus first and premier in our lives, that ministry of Jesus becomes important again, because all that's going on in our culture right now is just a, uh, uh, a revelation of its lostness. And Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and to save that which was lost. So, I don't see how anyone could miss this within the church right now. This letter is inviting. See, we're a spouse still to Jesus. We haven't entered into the, the nuptial chamber, as it were, the, the, the new Jerusalem as the bride of Christ. We're espoused to him. We're engaged to him. But this is a call. This letter is a call to renew the courtship. He's calling us to, uh, let's call it a courtship encounter. There's marriage encounters. Well, there's also courtship encounters. And this is a courtship encounter they invite us to. He's saying to the church in Ephesus, he might be saying it to you. He could be saying it to me. He might be saying, you know, Jeff, things don't seem like what they once were. What's the matter? He was asking about their love for him. His love for them had not changed. He was asking them about their love for him. So can we agree that this is a season of self-examination? That this is a season, as we said a few weeks ago, where judgment is beginning at the household of faith, where we are looking at ourselves to see if we're in the faith and to see if we're still in love with Jesus. You know, surrounded by the wealth and opulence, of Ephesus and the ruins of Ephesus revealed that there's much of the splendor the shadow of that splendor still very much visible in the city of Ephesus day tourists it's a very popular uh, place for tourists to come the amphitheater is still there the remnants of the large uh, gymnasia and, and the Archippean way that led out into the harbor there's only a single pillar of the Temple of Artemis, but nonetheless, uh, it's a glorious place to visit. I've seen the pictures and showing some of those to you in slides. But I can't even imagine how countercultural, how countercultural the Christian belief was in the shadow of that city, given to the cult worship of Artemis, very sensual cult worship of Artemis. Uh, the wealth that, that that cult worship brought in and the wealth that that seaport brought in. Surrounded by paganism, the church prospered in Ephesus. In Acts 19, which I read earlier from, there, there's no references that Paul ever taught against all of those pagan influences. It, 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 it seems pretty clear that he preached repentance to, of sin and faith towards Jesus Christ. He preached the kingdom. But there had become so many converts that just in the preaching of the gospel, making Jesus first, making much about Jesus, just a huge number of converts began to uh, impact uh, the loss of business for the silversmiths. So in Acts chapter 19, there's actually a massive riot that erupts because of Demetrius, the chief smith, silversmith. He, he saw his business dwindling. They made much money selling these small little idols, these small little shrines of, of Artemis to tourists and to worshipers. It was a lucrative business. And, and he uh, calls for them to stop this preaching. They weren't preaching against him. They were preaching Jesus. People were falling in love with Jesus and falling out of love with, with Artemis worship. The pressure to soften, apparently the pressure to soften their beliefs uh, to appease their pagan neighbors must have been so intense and so wearisome that somewhere along the line, the church in Ephesus lost their focus in Jesus. They never intended, no one ever intends to fall out of love. We fall into love to stay in love. No one ever intends to fall, purposely falls out of love, but it happened. Things happen, and they began to fall out of love with Jesus. Their focus on doctrine was still there. Their patient endurance was still there. But their love of Jesus was no longer there. And that concerned Jesus as their bridegroom. It drained their passion for Jesus. Jesus described this loss of love in terms then of a courtship. Of a romantic relationship. 
And so consider for a moment the things necessary to do to restore romance to a marriage. A couple pulls away. They look at the things that have been distracting them from each other. Uh, work, uh, volunteer responsibilities. And they pull away from those things temporarily, knowing they can't do that forever, but they pull away from those things to pull in closer together. Words of affection assumed but not spoken are said again. The couple starts dating again, spending time with each other again, talking to each other about everything. And they discover that as their love for each other is resumed, everything else in their life gets easier. And I think this is what Jesus was getting at with the church of Ephesus. Find me once again as your first love. And the resistance that you're feeling, it'll be easier to overcome that the more in love you are with me. So it is in our relationship with Jesus today. There is lots for us as the church to keep track of right now. Lots of things opposing sound doctrine. Lots of things that can cause much weariness and, and distraction from Jesus, uh, making us almost too tired to read his word and, and to spend time in prayer or to really do that, that mental discipline that it takes to worship Jesus with, with purity and sincerity and truth. There's so many examples going on in our world today. In your notes, I've listed some of those. These are things that I seem to deal with almost on a daily basis in conversation with different people, both within the church and outside of the church. Discerning fact from fiction when it comes to the news. Holding and defending a biblical response to all the cultural shifts going on in the area of human sexuality. The prevailing belief that evolution the prevailing belief of evolution, did you know it actually defends racism and the survival of the fittest? That's why racism is a sin. That's why the teaching of evolution is wrong. It actually defends racism and the survival of the fittest. That's why evolution is wrong. The Bible makes it very plain. There's one race of man. There's one race of man. But defending those things, explaining those things, takes energy. And then all the questions arising from the, the very seducing philosophies of our culture today, and, you, and these words need to become familiar to us because they're impacting much of what's going on underneath the scenes here in America, critical theory and intersectionality. You can check those out. We've talked about those some on the Wednesday night study. We're doing a much deeper dive in these areas on Wednesday. We'll do more of that uh, each Wednesday night. But, but critical theory and intersectionality are leading to the anarchy that's going on right now uh, in, our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our country, and, and it's driving the news cycles. Uh, uh, the gradual loss of our civil liberties, and, and it seems a slow advance towards social Marxism in our country. All of these things to talk about and, and try to resist, it's very easy for us to forget about Jesus. When we realize in the book of Ephesians and in the book of Acts, as the gospel first came to Ephesus, what was first and premier was Jesus. They greatly honored the name of Jesus. And then all these other things began to be dealt with. That's why Jesus has got to be first. We cannot afford to be distracted from Jesus. And the only way for us to get our first love back is to go back and do those things that each one of us did in the first days. Do you remember when you were first converted? I remember when I was first converted. I could not read the Bible. I could not study the Bible enough. I could not memorize scripture enough. I could not pray enough. I prayed on the way to class. I got saved in college. I prayed on the way to class. I prayed during class. I prayed when I was at the library studying. I prayed afterwards. I, I joined navigators. I went to navigators. I did things with the navigators. I, I couldn't study enough. I couldn't pray enough. And then I discovered worship. Not just singing at church, but I discovered worship. And I couldn't worship enough in those early days. Do you remember those early days? Tell me, weren't those early days of your conversion wonderful? I think that's what Jesus is calling us back to. Those wonderful first days when you fell in love with him. Do you remember your first love? Hopefully you're still in love if you're married. Remember your first love? You couldn't help but think about that other person all of the time. And if you had a chance, you told everybody about that person. 
so significant was the love that you had for them. You couldn't sleep at night sometimes because you loved them so much. You couldn't eat because you loved them so much. Jesus says, I want you to have that kind of relationship with me again. So that everything else that you're doing, your doctrinal stances, you're, you're resisting pushbacks within culture, the redefinitions that are all around us right now in, in society, that it would be born out of your love for Jesus. It makes everything easier. And frankly, it makes everything more impacting because ultimately, it's not your job to change minds. It's not your job to change opinions. It's your job to preach the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the Son of Man, who is Jesus, walking in the midst of the candlestick. Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man who came to seek and to save the lost. Just like he sought you and saved you, he wants to seek those around you and save them. So the best two people to decide how a relationship is going are the two people in the relationship, right? So uh, I'm not here to determine exactly where you are with Jesus in your relationship right now, but the title of this message is uh, Passionate About Doctrine, Passionless About Jesus, and we'll put a question mark behind it. Are you passionate about doctrine, but passionless about Jesus? Can I tell you some really good news from this letter? We know that they responded appropriately. The reason the church in Ephesus doesn't exist anymore is because the city just closed. It doesn't appear to have anything to do with the church. In 431 AD, so 331 years or so after this letter was written, Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, and when I use the word church, I'm talking about the collective group of churches, and probably there were many, many churches meeting in many homes. We have a church of Lawrence. There's many, many uh, bodies of Christ here in Lawrence, Kansas, many, many church buildings, many, many congregations, but there's one church of Lawrence, and that one church in Ephesus hosted the Council of Ephesus. This council uh, dealt with the deity and the humanity of Christ, trying to decide what's the Bible really teach about uh, this dual nature of Jesus, born to a woman, but God, very God. Uh, they came back again in 449 AD for a second council, very famous council of Ephesus, where they wrestled through the same thing again. So it's very interesting. If they were going to have a meeting, they went to the most important, significant place. It wasn't in Jerusalem anymore. They went to a very accessible, very important, significant church to host their meetings. That goes on today. Uh, when I go to meetings, I go to the bigger churches. I go to the significant churches, the ones that are making a, a, a bigger impact. And so Ephesus was hosting those meetings, obviously. When Jesus said, you've lost your first love, they responded appropriately. That means we can too. And then in a closing compliment, Jesus is such a wonderful leader, isn't he? First, he commends the church in Ephesus. I know your works. I know your works. I know your faithfulness. I know your patient endurance that you're not growing weary, but, I, but you've also lost your first love, so there's commendation, correction, and then he finishes with another con, con, uh, commendation. He says, you know what? I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans too. The word uh, Nicolaitan comes from the word Nikon. We use the word in our language, Nike or Nike, uh, Conqueror. It's a shoe company. It's a sporting uh, wear uh, company. And this word Nicholas or Nicolod uh, <laughs> Nicolations, uh, 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 Nicolations uh, represent those who are trying to conquer the church, to destroy the church. Some scholars say they were the, uh, a sect that followed Nicholas, an early convert described in Acts uh, told about in Acts 6-5, who later fell into Gnosticism, which was just this very common philosophy of believing higher revelation, uh, revelation outside of Scripture. It became a very seductive philosophy, typically leading to some kind of sexual license. And, of course, in a town like Ephesus, uh, the, the compromises of the Nicolaitans could have been very, very dangerous to the church, seducing them away from the purity of their love for Jesus uh, to share that purity with uh, the idol Artemis or some of the other gods and goddesses that were worshipped in this very polytheistic city of Ephesians. So there were those trying to conquer the church, but there's a reward to another kind of conquer because, again, it's the same word, root word, for uh, 
these uh, Nicolaitans, and then this promise in verse 7, to the one who conquers. The root word of that word is Nikon as well. So there's two kinds of conquerors. There's those trying to destroy the church, and there's those that are trying to overcome in the name of Jesus. And he commends those by saying, you'll eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. Once in the Garden of Eden, now in the paradise of God, now in the New Jerusalem. This tree of life that, that uh, overshadows the central stream of the river of life. On either side of the tree of life is this, are these beautiful golden streets, the pavement which is, a, is gold. Remember we've emphasized in previous sermons over the years that in the end we get it all back at the restoration of all things. We get it all back. Staying strong to the finish that comes with the promise and we can celebrate that. Saying, hold on, hold on, hold on. Your message, your light, your witness is so valuable right now. This city needs it, our state needs it, our nation needs it, and as we have opportunity to impact the world through our missionaries, the world needs the light of the gospel. The world needs a vibrant, vibrant representation of Jesus Christ. And so I close. Have you ever been around someone, man or woman, and the church is gonna host a marriage encounter, or there's one being in Can hosted in Kansas City. We've hosted a couple here in our building, and then of course, we urge people to go to uh, uh, marriage encounters in other cities. Have you ever heard someone say this? I don't wanna to go to those, one of those marriage encounters because I don't wanna be told what a rotten husband I am or what a terrible wife I am. And I'm thinking, number one, if you're saying that and you know that you are, repent, change. If you're fishing for compliments, I hope your spouse heard that and your, your spouse will compliment you in your relationship, that you'll be able to overcome your insecurities. But we just have to do a self-check right now. Are you passionate? There's other questions to ask in the Bible. But this morning, the question is, are you passionate? Are you more passionate about this word, written word, than you are the word? The word became flesh the word Jesus Christ. We don't worship the Bible, this word. We worship the Logos of God, the Son of God. Are you more passionate about this written book and its doctrines than you are about Jesus? In reality, you don't separate either one, but it begins with Jesus. That's the question. That's the question. Jesus is the Son of Man in the midst of the candlestick. He's walking in the midst of the candlestick. Do you know him as your savior because he came first to seek and to save that which was lost? He's seeking right now. He's wanting to save right now. And if you're one of his redeemed, if you're one of his redeemed, do a self-check in your love toward him. Has things happened in your life that's pulled you away from him? I'm discovering, to be totally honest, during shelter in place and the absence of the church gathering together. We've tried to do it online. We're doing that now with all of you that can't come because of health concerns, and we certainly understand that. But in the absence of gathering and, and uh, some of the intensity of our days, there can be a neglect of our first relationship with Jesus. And I want to call us all back to that. We're gonna look at six more letters in the next coming weeks, but I think it's important that we begin with our love for Jesus. Can we wrestle with that and, and, and think about that in the days ahead? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it, the hope that comes from it. Jesus, if there is anything between me and you, please, I want to get over that and come closer to you. Father, those that have heard me, if there's anything in their lives, God, oh, please, I pray, Lord, that that relationship be restored to vitality, health, and real joy, that we'd remember what it was like in those first days with you, Jesus. And we ask all of these things in your name. God bless you. I hope you had a wonderful fourth yesterday. Keep praying for our nation. Keep letting your light shine before men that they might see your good works and give glory to our Father, which is in heaven. God bless you all.